Okay, um, not too many people here yet, um, but uh, maybe we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so kind of, yeah, my agenda was probably to mostly review the assignment three here, kind of go over it to start with, and then, um, and then maybe after the break, we can talk a little bit about the logistic regression materials and things. So, uh, but anyway, that's what I was thinking, but you know, as usual, feel free to ask other questions or, um, or if you want to know anything, just let me know. So, um, so I did post for, for you that they are here already. Um, there is an example solution. And um, there's also a set of test data. So some more generated data. Um, I'll kind of show you an example of that here. Of, of how you can use that here. Um, and I also just posted an example kind of model um, submission of somebody that did pretty well. So maybe we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So in particular, they had done some stuff using a grid search. So this was kind of the first assignment where we use scikit-learn where we had some meta parameters. So, um, and we never, we haven't talked about grid search or meta parameter search, but uh, we might at some point be able to talk a little bit more about that kind of stuff. So. Um, okay, let me go ahead and rerun this. Make certain it's all running here. Um, all right. So I'll start by kind of uh, showing you, um, so in, in the solution that I posted, there's actually a section that you didn't have, which has all the code that I used to actually generate the random data that you were, the random regression data that you were trying to, uh, well, not so random, the, the, the data, um, the, the polynomial function that was used to create the data for this uh, assignment three. Um, yeah, so in this case, I mean, it was a it was a um, degree five polynomial, and it used exactly these parameters. So, um, uh, intercept of five, and then we had minus four for x to the one power, and five for x to the two, and so on, right? So anyway, if you're interested, um, um, but um, the other thing is that um, in that uh, post, whoops, in in the uh, the the post here. So there's also a second set of data, and um, well, maybe I should add this to the, the class repository as well. So I, I generated that using exactly the same function, um, although there's a thousand points, um, a thousand um, samples uh, in that, uh, what I call the test data set, right? So anyway, you can use that now, if, if you're interested, you can use that to go back um, as as I'll talk about here in a bit, to um, to see how your own best model, you know, how what um, you actually get in terms of um, uh, the the root mean squared error um, that we're using to evaluate our performance on this data set here. Okay, so this is typical of if anybody's ever run across like the Kaggle or other kind of computation set sites like this. So often what they do, uh, actually what they normally do for these kinds of competitions, they give you um, a set of data and they give you a set of, of data that you can use called validation data that, that's also publicly viewable. So, so normally you train your data with a training set and you try and validate it with a validation set, but then they keep a, a final test set um, as a hidden secret, right? And, and your um, results, your final result on the competition depends on how well you actually do on that test set that they never actually release uh, publicly, okay? But you can submit your code uh, while the, the competition is running and they run it on the test set for you and just give back your final performance measure, right? So, um, 
if I use the assign assignment again in the future for this class, I might try and see if I can set it up that way and figure out some way that people can submit what they're working on and, and get back just that one number, which is, you know, the your root mean squared error or how your best model is doing against the hidden test data that, that, uh, that you don't know what it is. Um, Um, okay, so I don't think anybody had any problems really loading it, you know, um, or I think most people were creating an overfit model fine, I, I think if I remember, I don't think, except for maybe one or two people did have a bit of a problem visualizing these things. So, that, so, so let me kind of make it explicit. You, you can look at the example solution, um, but, uh, but yeah, so if you create, a degree, uh, a model using a degree 20 polynomial like we do here. And, and if you fit it, um, so here we're fitting using our 20, our, our 20 um, derived polynomial features. We're fitting this uh, simple linear regression model with no regularization in it. Right, and then we're plotting the result. Okay, so to plot the, um, oh, I should have, uh, I think I, I actually complained to some people about this myself. I, I should have had the, um, the legend on here. I said, you know, um, for a couple of people that you, sh you shouldn't forget to add your legend in there um, as well um, when you're plotting these kinds of things. So, there we go, it's a little bit better. Um, so yeah, I mean, a, a few, not, not very many people, but a few people were having a little bit of difficulty actually getting, you know, your model, right? So I, I've talked about this before in this class. I mean, when you're plotting raw data, you should really use a scatter plot. You should use points. But when you're plotting a model, you know, a, some sort of prediction or a, a, a fitted set of, um, uh, uh, fitted model like we have here, um, you should use a line uh, because this gives you, I mean, in theory, in theory, the line is continuous. So this is giving you exactly what the prediction is going to be made by this model that we just fit here, right? The, the green line. Okay. So, you know, to, to do this, um, so the, the main problem that a lot of people were having was they tried to plot this using either, um, using either the original X data um, like, like the X data that you loaded or using, uh, not, not using the, uh, uh, some, something that you had called where you predicted, you know, where you called predict on the model. Okay. So, so, but anyway, to, to plot a nice smooth line, you have to have your X values be sorted or be arranged linearly. Okay. So for example, you can create, use like lin space or a range or something. So this will create the values from negative one to one, but they will be sorted, you know, so the first value will be negative one and the next value will be negative 0 0.9, 0 0.8 or, you know, whatever, whatever the step size is, right, up to one, right, but they'll be in sorted order because that's important when you plot it. So, and then you also have to use this, you have to use the sorted data and, and send that to your prediction to get the predictions for all the data in your sorted order, right? Um, and in this case, before I can use, so since my model was fit expecting you know, uh, you know, 20 features or, or the, the derived 20 polynomial features, I, I first have to do a fit transform using, you know, my polynomial feature um, object to, to, to transform from a single feature into my 20 derived polynomial features, right? But once you do that, then you can just call predict. Now the outputs from that, what I called the Y hat for degree 20, uh, are the predictions for the, the x's, you know, for, for the corresponding x's in the sorted order. So, the, so the, the first value that comes out of this prediction will, will be the value predicted for negative, for the value negative one. And then the second value prediction, okay, and so maybe I'm kind of, like I said, mo most people got this, and so maybe I'm kind of belaboring this a little bit, but the, you know, if, if you got like messy lines all over the place or something, it's because you, you've got to create a different set of X values that are in sorted order and you have to run those, you have to put those through the prediction function, um, possibly having to transform, you know, transform to add the polynomial features and then predictions and, and so that you have the corresponding 
predictions for each of the x values, but in the sorted order. And, and that way you'll get your nice line, all right? So, you know, I did want to kind of spend a little bit of time on that because I do want, I mean, it's, it's a somewhat simple thing, but, but if you didn't understand why your plot looks messy or something like that, you really should understand that, you know, what, why that is and, and how you get an actual visualization of a fitted model as a line um, on your data here. Okay, um, yeah, I think that's enough about that. Any, any kind of questions before I move on here? Um, so another common thing, I mean, a lot of people, instead of using, giving plotting learning curves, we're just plotting, um, replotting a, a fitted model against the data points for all these things, which wasn't exactly what I asked for, Although I didn't really take a lot off for that. And then I guess it's kind of understandable because that's kind of what I did on the, um, the, uh, the, the examples in the lecture notebooks. Okay. But, but here kind of, uh, I'll probably mention this a couple of times, but the, you know, you really want the learning curves here because these are telling us some things about how well the parameters are doing in terms of getting our model to underfit or overfit or be better, you know, or, or to be kind of just right. So, um, so the, the Goldilocks, uh, not too hot, not too cold, not overfit and underfit, but just right. So, and, and, and you can kind of derive that information. So we've talked a little bit about that, how you use learning curves like this, where you're plotting training and validation, um, performance on your cost measure together, um, and then using this, these learning curve plots to make determinations on, you know, kind of what you should be, be able to expect as the, um, um, the, the kind of cost you should be able to achieve with your models and being able to maybe detect whether you're overfitting or not. Um, so, so the first, for the first one, you were supposed to just fit a degree 20 polynomial model, again, with no regularization. So the easiest way to do that is to use a pipeline if you're using that scikit-learn. Um, um, so we have a pipeline where we use the polynomial features to derive the, the 20 input features from a single feature. And then we just put that into a regular linear regression with no regularization, right? And then you can just, you can send a pipeline like that directly to anything that expects like a model that you can call fit on um, and predict. Uh, you can also pass a pipeline to it and, and, and it will also do the fit and predict, but, but it'll pass it through all the items in the pipeline. Uh, whenever, for example, you call fit, it first um, transforms it using the polynomial features, and then it, uh, pa it passes that on in the pipeline to the next thing to, to actually do the predictions from the, the newly derived features, right? So, so that's the simplest thing. So a common mistake, I mean, a lot of people on these three steps, well, I shouldn't say a lot, a few people were correctly creating a pipeline, but then um, we're having, we're using the pipeline to plot the learning curve. So we're either like pulling out just the linear regression or, or we're using like your linear regression object from the previous step to plot the learning curves, okay? So I can tell, I mean, if you didn't, like, like on this, on the step three, so one of the purposes of this learning curve here on step three was if, if we're overfitting, uh, we, we, we can kind of tell that we're overfitting because the validation data just looks horrible com for most of the range compared to the, 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 the cost on the data that we actually train with. Okay, so that, that's a sign of overfitting uh, when, when we see that, when we, when we see a gap, um, and, and the gap basically stays there for most of the learning curve, right? Uh, but the other thing is that this kind of tells us for, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of highly, well, we're, we're overfitting this model. Um, so we can see that it can be possible to get down below 0.4, you know, uh, maybe to 0.2 or 0.3. So that, that's kind of, that's giving us a piece of information. Like I talked a little bit about in our um, lecture videos for this week, that um, if, if we do it right, we, we might be able to get a, a model um, 
to get something, maybe not all the way down to 0.2, but, but somewhere around in that range, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, somewhere in there. Um, even on data that it hasn't been trained with yet. So on validation or test data, okay? So that's kind of the most important information. And that's why you often start off with a model that, that you are pretty certain or you believe is gonna be overfitting just so that you can find, okay, what are your targets, right? So do I see there's evidence that it's overfitting? And if I do, what does it achieve on the overfitting on the training, uh, which kind of tells, it gives me kind of a lower bound um, so that um, if I later on train a model with that, that's not overfitting, I'm, I'm hoping I can, I can at least approach or start getting down to around the, the same performance that I could get with my, on the training data that we overfit with there. Okay. So that, that's, that's why, I mean, that's, that's one of the things you should be doing with learning curves like this um, and, and why you often start with, you know, um, a model that you're hoping is going to be overfitting your data there. So yeah, I mean, you should have basically, if you were doing this right, you know, had your train your your training cost function end up around 0.2 or 0.25 or so. So I, I could spot if something was wrong by looking at that, assuming that you plotted the um, the, the the learning curves, and I could spot, um, you know, you should have gotten like a a pretty good high fit, like a 0.97 here. Most of your fits for these other steps, part four and five and six, probably shouldn't have been quite that high usually, but you still usually got like 0 0.93, 95, 96 or so for the, the fit, the R, the, the R squared score here, okay? Um, and, you know, I, I probably didn't talk enough about what this R squared score is. And, you know, if you're, if you're kind of fuzzy on that, you really ought to go back uh, or maybe look at Wikipedia or something, you know, or, or, or bring up a stat. So, so this is, um, I mean, this is different from the cost function, right? Th this is a, um, a, a evaluation of how well your model fits the data. So the best you can ever do for an R square score is a, a score of one, right? Um, and you can get like, like a zero score means that, that you have your, your fit is not doing anything. So there's no, your, your fit, your model is not explaining any of the um, of, of the um, information that's in the data. That's, that's kind of what an R squared of zero is. You can you can get a zero, or you can get a negative as well if if you have a negative kind of correlation. Um, so, so you're kind of backwards on your your model fit with what you're hoping to, to predict. So. I guess another way I could spot that, that, you know, something wasn't right here. I mean, if you're fitting a degree 20 polynomial, you should get, you know, one intercept and 20 coefficients. So I should see a full 20 coefficients if you print these out here, one for each of the 20 derived uh, polynomial features that you were trying to fit here uh, for the model, right? So if you're only having one, if you only had like one coefficient or less than 20, uh, it, it means you were doing the problem that I was talking about. You you weren't really passing in the pipeline or or, or something. Not quite right there. So. All right, uh, questions. That was that was kind of trying to overfit there. The part three. Um, so. Like for, for part four and five, then you were supposed to be applying some regularization using um, the ridge and the lasso or using, you know, the, the ridge is the L2 norm that we talked about. So that's, that's just adding in the, the sum of the squares of the weights and the, the lasso is the L1, uh, which is just adding in the absolute value right, just to kind of review this, this regularization. Uh, also to review kind of in practical terms, what it means is often, you, you, we usually use the L2 norm more than the L1 because normally when you have a set of features, um, you, 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 you might normally do some data cleaning. So you might try and identify features that are correlated or that are just um, um, linear combinations of each other. And, and if that's, if that's the case, if you have features that are highly correlated or just copies of each other's or some, you know, for example, you might have two features, which is the, 
the size of your house in square feet and the size of your house in square meters. But those should be exactly linearly correlated. So usually it's not useful to keep two features like that that are just um, copies of, of each other, maybe transform into, transformed into different um, units or something like that. But, but, but they're gonna be, what, there's going to be a one-to-one -one correlation between the size in square feet versus the size in square meters, right? You want to drop that, right? But, but yeah, so normally you kind of, kind of um, weed out any highly correlated or exactly correlated features by doing some data cleaning first. So in that, thus, if you've done that, you know, using lasso or L1 is not so important because you've hopefully already removed the features that are kind of not really needed or that are correlated um, from your data. But, you know, L2 correlation uh, could still be very useful or, or ridge regression, or sorry, ridge regularization if you're talking about uh, linear regression. Um, because even though all the features might be useful, some features are going to be more important than others. Um, and by running it through the L2 regularization, um, you will um, uh, emphasize the ones that are more important to be able to explain the, uh, the data that you have. And you'll de-emphasize the ones that are less important, kind of in an automated way. That's, that's kind of what this L2 or the ridge regularization is doing. So, so yeah, I mean, I was kind of expecting people to try different values of the alpha by hand, you know. Um, so if, if you make your alpha too big, um, so if, if you make it too small, uh, you're not really doing any regularization. So, so when it's too small, you're going to be expecting that you might still be overfitting, right? So, um, so if I rerun all those up to this point, but with like a really small alpha, uh, maybe even smaller, how about like um, 0 0.0001? So. Um, so you can see, I mean, you know, it still had an effect, kind of, so, so it definitely looks better in terms of, I mean, it's, it's kind of over, but, but maybe, uh, and, and not only that, but, but um, um, I mean, it, it's probably still overfitting because notice that the, the training cost is still a little bit higher than it was before, uh, about the same about 0.2, right? So it's probably still overfitting a bit, right? So that's probably a little bit too low, right? Um, but if you go the other way, uh, well, in this case, because the, the, the um, model is, is kind of, is overly powerful, it's a degree 20 polynomial, and we know that the degree is, is you know, I already told you, it's um, um, back up here at the top, it's a, it's it, the, the true degree of the polynomial is, is degree five with these parameters here, right? So, um, so what I was going to say is that, um, that, yeah, it doesn't really actually really hurt. If you have an over um, powerful model, uh, using lots of regularization will just tend to drive it down to uh, the, 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 if, if you have too much, the, the, the problem here is that I have so much that um, with my cross-validation, it still hasn't quite reached its optimal. So it looks like both of these measures are still um, decreasing, right? So, so I might have too much. So, so uh, by too much, it, it's going to take too long to get there before um, I do my, my cross-validation for the learning curves uh, since I've only got 100 points here. So that's, that's kind of the... Um, the problem with, with having a little bit too much here. If I had more data points or if I was doing uh, learning curves where I was doing like um, uh, batch grading descent where we were plotting epochs instead of the, the, the training set size, uh, I could just keep training longer and, and we would eventually kind of reach, um, both of these would get back down to like below 0.4 or around 0.3 here, right? But yeah, it's probably too much here. 
So, you know, you should probably should have tried, you know, played around with it um, and, and see. So here's better. So now both of these, compared to what was before, are below, uh, below 0.4 here. And, and we're probably not really overfitting, at least not so much, because we, we, uh, the, the, the validation has crossed the training relatively quickly here. It's even below it. So, uh, so like, I think a good value, if you're just doing this by hand, is about 0.1 or 0.05 or something like that. So notice this gets us all the way down to like a 0.3 for the cost function here. Right? Again, remember, so we noticed what we, we saw with the overfitting that, that in theory, we can maybe get it all the way close down to 0.2, right? If we're, if we're really doing well. So. so, yeah, probably about 0 0.05, 0 0.1, maybe is kind of a good range for your, um, for your regularization for the alpha here, for the, for the amount of L2 regularization that you're going to be doing um, here. So. All right, does that make sense? I mean, that, that's the kind of stuff that, that you, you know, these learning curves are really, you know, useful, right? So every, everybody that does machine learning, when they start getting to the point they want to tune their model, are going to be plotting learning curves like this in order to try and understand what their, you know, how their model is performing and, and, um, and what the effects of tuning parameters are having on their model performance. So, so it's good to be able to understand how to read these from, from, a, from the, practical, for the practical end of doing kind of this machine learning tuning. So, all right. So again, if you did this, I would have expected, you know, again, an R squared score of 0.95 or something at least. Uh, well, maybe, you know, maybe 0.93 or 0.94. But also, you know, since we're doing the L2 regularization, I would expect that you would still have all 20 of these parameters have values. All, all 20 of these coefficients had values, right? Because again, the, the effect of L2 is, is it doesn't eliminate these like the L1 regularization does. That's a practical effect. It'll kind of keep them around. It'll just deal, it'll, it'll emphasize, or it'll make them bigger for the ones that are truly helping explain, um, and it will kind of de-emphasize or make smaller the, the ones that, that aren't so useful in getting a good model fit here. Um, all right, so, you know, and it wouldn't hurt then after this to, to also plot the fit for a model. I didn't do that in my data, in my, in, in the example solution here, but, you know, you, you could certainly plot your fit after for once you pick an alpha or pick a couple of different alphas to see um, how it looks compared to the raw data it would also be useful to understand what's happening and, and look at things, so. All right, questions? So then the part five is gonna be, I don't know if I've, you know, the, 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 in this case, I guess part five is maybe more important for this assignment than part four because you kind of know that, that the, the, the polynomial that you're trying to model is, is, is the, the, the best fit, the best model is going to be less than a degree 20 because I kind of told you that, right? So in this case, um, the L1 regularization uh, can definitely be a lot more helpful than it might normally be uh, be because if, if you explore this, this might give you a feel for maybe where, what the, the true degree of the polynomial is that you're trying to fit by seeing which parameters tend to drop out to zero when, when you add in the, 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 the lasso or the L1 regularization here, right? So, you know, again, um, if you don't add any, um, so in this case though, I mean, I don't know if I could exactly explain it, but, um, uh, well, if, if you just make it zero, you'll get like a, a, um, you'll get all these kind of errors about convergence. Um, so we need to add a little bit. So 
let's see here. Somebody asked a question. But, but yeah, it has to be really, really, so even really, really small values um, until you get down to getting kind of those non-convergence problems um, still show a little bit of an effect. So, so it doesn't look like it overfits nearly as much, even with a really small kind of value there. Um, so in this case, that's probably telling us that, um, so, oh, sorry, I'm, I was doing the wrong value there. That's not what I meant. So um, what did I have before? Talents of 0.1. So here, as I keep adding this more and more, I mean, you know, it's, it's still doesn't, to me, it doesn't look like it's overfitting too bad. And, you know, we're still getting both the training and the validation down to 0.4 or so. Until presumably make that zero, this is just a regular, so this should be, uh, but yeah, we're gonna get the convergence problems, um, but, um, that would just be a regular um, linear regression if we don't have any of this regularization. So, um, okay, so um, somebody asked, um, when looking at the learning curve regularizations, is okay for the validation curve dips below the trading curves? Um, I mean, that does happen, right? And, and, and of course, you know, I've seen a couple of, of the, I've shown a couple of examples of that. So the validation curve can end up below the training curve, which, which might seem a little bit strange that that can happen. Um, let's see if I can get it back to, to show an example of that. So, so yeah, there, there was an example of that, right? Um, so that doesn't necessarily, I mean, you know, that's, um, that, that's not necessarily a problem, even though, it, you know, it's a good question, even though that, um, uh, if you think about it a little bit, that might seem a bit strange, um, uh, but, um, um, just because of the, the, the randomization of the cross validation. So what ends up in the test set versus the training set um, can uh, kind of affect that, you know? Um, so, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm gonna have to think about my, myself some more here to give a better answer than, than this, but, but it, it's it definitely not that unusual for, for the validation to actually even be a bit below the training, so. And, but yeah, I don't necessarily consider that though as, as an indication that, that it's a, a good fit either though. So, so I don't really necessarily myself give any special kind of value to that, that they're crossing. It's, it tends to be more just the, the, the variation, the randomness of your test train splits for cross validation and other things can, can get that to happen, right? And I'm sure there's a better explanation for that if I, um, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, so the, 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 the since usually the, the question was about, yeah, the randomization or the split again. So again, you can get particularly unlucky and especially when we only have a hundred pieces of data and when we get down to here, even down to here, uh, well, there's only going to be 20, uh, when we're doing an 80, 20 split, there's 80 in the training set and there's only 20 in the test set. So there's not a whole lot of data that's being, uh, uh, tested with or, or for the validation part. So, so yeah, you can expect to see a lot of variation there. Um, all right. So, so anyway, um, back to the L1 or the lasso regularization. Um, I should probably, yeah, you know, I, I don't have a real good, um, I mean, some people did ask me about this convergence warning. Um, you know, it, it has to do again with some stuff that you learned about in this class. It's, it's the, um, um, the optimization method that's being used is having some issues, uh, with convergence. Um, but I would, I, I probably do need to go and, um, uh, read up a little bit more. But, but as, as I told some people, uh, 
just because you know we're getting good r squared values and, and things look reasonable so sometimes the, these kind of convergence problems can mean that you're getting bad results <laughs> and sometimes it can mean that um, uh, i mean things are okay really right and, and it's kind of to me it's, it can be kind of really hard unless you do some a lot of digging on the particular message you're getting but uh, normally if, if you go off then and plot like um you know, like your other measures, and if things still seem reasonable, probably the, the convergence warnings that you're getting um, aren't significant for your results um, at that point, right? And yeah, and you know, I know that's that's a little bit um, a little bit vague, um, but, um, uh, but because the, the the basic answer is that yeah, sometimes those really can be a real problem, and, and sometimes. Like in this case, I don't really think that they're that big of an issue that, that we're just getting one or two of these little convergence message for the optimizer that we're using. And if, if probably if I went and digged around with it some more, again, if we if we get these parameters set right and maybe use a different um, optimizer, we'd be able to um, get it so that it's not having those issues there with the convergence. Um, So yeah, in this case, uh, yeah, really, for my when doing this tuning this kind of by hand, uh, you only need a very small amount of the L1 or lasso regularization to uh, for this model. If you make it um, too high, so so now my bat my results are getting above 0.4, um, and you'll see that a lot of the the parameters don't drop out. Well, I mean, it wasn't so bad with that one, but. Um, Let's go up to point one. So remember, um, um, the kind of the results since parameters are dropping out here. Um, well, yeah. So, so if, if we want to get some idea of of which parameters might be um, the most useful, so that was definitely too high, right? Uh, so we, we can see that it pretty muchly dropped everything except for the x and the x squared, um, and and we got. Um, our cost function was, was bad, right? It went way up above 0.4, which, or, or 0.2, which we know we can get down to 0.2 or 0.3 or so when we're overfitting, right? So, so that one, that, that, that was going a little bit too far. Um, but yeah, if we go down here, so we're getting back down to the 0.4 range. So, but, oh, well, yeah. So, so even with that, so notice, so, so here is, is kind of where you can begin seeing, so, so, so now, the, the 0.1 versus the 0 0.01, they, they both were giving me an X squared model, but in this case, you know, the, the, the cost didn't look quite so bad, although still it's maybe a bit high, right? But again, this might be still a little bit high. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, um, I was probably misstating that because I didn't, I probably didn't rerun this cell here. Um, there we go. Uh, so, so yeah, okay. That, so, so forget what I just said. So back to the point zero one. Um, yeah. So again, I mean, notice that it did have a lot. So, so the, the kind of what I wanted to do here, kind of what I wanted you to do is to find some parameters to get a little bit of a feel. So, so here we, we've got things all the way up to uh, one, two, three, five, seven, eight, I mean, you know, all the way up to, you know, the, the X to the 18th power or so, even though it's pretty small, um, some of these higher powers. So, um, so you know, it, again, kind of a, an offhand comment I gave to some people, it might be good to make that a little bit higher than what you might want to actually use, just so you, you, we could get a feel for, um, what the, the 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 most likely useful parameters are um, for the polynomial here, the, the the degree of the polynomial. So, but again, I, I mean, I'll, I'll agree. It's it's, it's um, so here I'm I'm kind of doing this ad hoc, just doing it by kind of by hand, um, just at random, trying some different things, showing stuff. So yeah, I, again, I really don't like that fit. It feels too high. Um, but even with that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, even down here, we had like 0 0.2, 0 0.17. 
up to uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, up to the the thirteenth power here or so. Um, Oh, that, well, although I keep, I think I keep doing that. Did I do that? I forgot to run the cell again. So even though we had that, so point one is given, oh yeah, so, I've, I'm, so again, yeah, I forgot to rerun the cell. So point one is probably too high. It's, it's, it's dropping maybe too much. Um, I need to remember to run both of these cells here. To, that looks probably a little bit more reasonable, although the cost is a little bit, off here, but that might give us kind of a better feel for the parameters if I do it right. So yeah, I mean that that's that's kind of what I was trying to get. So so that is maybe so 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 here we're, we're maybe not doing very well because you know our cost is 0.5 or above 0.6 or so um, on the the train here, but I can see that it it dropped the. Um, it only kept up to the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, up to the ninth degree polynomial here. So, so, the, so, so to me, playing around with that probably tells me that that you know maybe uh, at least an upper bound of degree nine or degree eight might be reasonable, um, a reasonable idea of of of, of a of a guess here for the polynomial. So. Um, okay, um, so then for the last part, um, so I just had an example, uh, so from what I was just saying, um, you know, maybe I should have had this higher than from, from kind of the exploring, the explorations that I was doing there, so maybe degree eight or degree nine might be better from what I was just my discussion there as my best guess for the estimate of the true polynomial degree. Um, but uh, yeah, but, but I might suspect that that's still a little bit high. So I might want to have a little bit of, of L2 normalization. So using a little bit of ridge regression, um, ridge, ridge regularization um, uh, in this case, right? But you know, we definitely want to make certain that um, we're seeing at least pretty similar to the best that we were seeing before. So, seeing both of these curves come down to the the uh, you know point three or, or approaching point two or so. So I mean, you know, that that doesn't look too bad to me right now. Um, so it, so when I did that with the degree eight, I should get my eight coefficients. Um, in the intercept term, um, and, and also I'd want to make certain that my R, R squared score still seems comparable to what I was seeing for some of the better ones that I was doing before. So yeah, I mean it was good. 0 0.97 again there. Um, and then just um, then yeah, I was just looking for you to kind of uh, show a final display where you fit that to the um, the, the, the data point. So, so in this case, kind of from my description, this was sort of my best model, kind of an estimate with eight degrees of freedom, or sorry, with, with a polynomial of degree eight that I just did here. Um, And you get something like that. I mean, you know, and again, looking at the, the raw data, I mean, this, this seems pretty good, you know, right? So, so it does seem, it's, it's smooth. Um, it's, it's not showing big wild changes anywhere. Um, and, and it's going through kind of the heart of, of most of the data that I had that I was using to train with, right? So, uh, and then here, you know, kind of the, the thing is, is I just ended up training this one on all 100 data points that we had. Um, although that's not, uh, we, uh, we, we played a little bit loose with, with this data here, so I'm, I'm maybe showing you some kind of bad examples, right? But, but we were kind of using the data both for all of it for training, but also splitting it with, for training and validation. So, but that was kind of because I only gave you 100 data points. Um, 
if, if you have real data, it's better to really kind of do a, a, a train validation test split right at the beginning, especially if you have enough data to do that and to always, you know, kind of keep your data that you're training with kind of separate from what you use for validation and stuff. So. Um, yeah, but you know, so if you do this yourself, you know, you could go back and then compare your parameters um, to um, the, uh, let me split this here. Um, So we can go back to, um, or is it, there it is. This, um, and you can compare, so this was the intercept, point, uh, five. So a lot of people, so, so no matter what degree polynomial you're using, you often get kind of pretty close to the right intercept, but then you can compare the other. So this was the x to the one, um, negative 4.8 compared to negative four, and this was the x squared, six compared to five. This is the x cubed. So, so notice, I mean, normally then yeah, you start getting less and less accurate. So three instead of negative one and, and so on, right? If you happen to get exactly the right polynomial degree with, with regression, you would see that you would end up getting pretty good, right? So, so if I just happen to decide that, that five was kind of the better model, Uh, oops. There we go. Um, so, so, I mean, if you could get that kind of right, you, you'd probably find that these end up being pretty, well, I mean, not bad, right? So, but normally, I mean, again, you know, you, you wouldn't, it, for real data, you wouldn't know. I mean, and, and, and in fact, in the real world, the, the whatever the system is that's generating your data, um, I mean, it, it's going to be more, it, it's definitely could potentially be much more messy than something, even a, a simple linear or polynomial function that's generating the data like this, right? So, so, so normally kind of what you do in machine learning and, and also like deep learning is, is you want to have a model that, that's at least as powerful or probably you want it to be more powerful than what's likely to be the real function that's governing the relationship. Uh, and then use some regularization um, in order to get a relatively good fit, which was kind of what I was showing here with like degree eight, right? So even though we got parameters and, and the, the the ones aren't exactly, um, you know, so, so there'll be quite a few differences between these, but you know, the, the higher parameters, even though they weren't in the actual function that was generating this data, end up giving a good approximation over this range, right? So, um, so yeah, a little, a little more post analysis. Um, so if, if you look at this, uh, and, and you can try this on your own model that you made, if you want to. Um, so now that you kind of know the true model, I mean, you can, you can use that to plot the, the true model function with, with your data. So um, let's see if I make sure I'm using the same model that I used before, best model, oh, final model. I wanted to use final model. Might have had a mistake in this notebook here. <laughs> um, So there was the final model, I think, that I just did, right? So, so but uh, now that you know the true function, you could plot your model, um, for example, with, with the true function that was generating the data to get a better feel for how well you did um, on your fit. Um, you might also, like I said, you know, you might want to look at the, the test data that I had. Uh, this was just generating another thousand points using the same function here with, with random noise. But um, like, 
for my final model here, um, so I, I don't claim that this is really real great, you know, so if I would have done some more metaparameter tuning, I could maybe even get this even better, right? But uh, you would only want to tune on the, 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 the training data that I gave you, but then you might want to evaluate it uh, finally on this test data. So never, never use this test data to try and tune your model only use the original training data that I gave you, but then you could use this, you know, so, so I think that, that if you did well in your training, you can probably approach point three for your final mean squared error on this, this set of taste, test data. So in this case, I'm getting about point three two. but yeah, if you're getting above, below point three five, you probably did, you know, pretty well on your estimate of um, your model for this assignment here. Um, if, if you try it out yourself. So, um, so yeah, just to kind of finish off. So if your model was underpowered, so like if you decided it was like a degree three polynomial, which I don't think anybody really did that, but um, um, but so what you would see is that um, so notice the validation never quite gets down. Um, and, and, and our training is, is, is kind of a bit high as well from what we know, you know, it's, 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 get, it's more like about 0.4 uh, here for, for the uh, degree three model because it's underpowered in this case. So what you'll get for that um, is, I mean, really the best you can do is about a 0.4, even if I use, if I tune this as much as, so if I used a, a more formal like a grid search or something and, and, and tuned this a lot, I, I probably wouldn't be able to do much better than 0.4 for, you know, my model that's not really powerful enough for this set of data here. Um, because a, a cubic is just not going to quite fit over this whole range, the, uh, the, the true function well here. So. Um, Yeah, and I kind of want to wrap up and take a break here, but yeah, if you, you know, so to finish off this section, I showed uh, maybe a, a, a model that was a little bit too high, so your estimate was, was a bit overpowered, but that's probably fine if you just use a little bit of regularization as well. So if you, again, if you use like a polynomial degree 10, so this, this is looking like it's overfitting a bit here still. So, so our, our training is down to about that point two, a little bit higher than that. Um, but, uh, but we have more of a gap than what we see a lot of time on these learning curves. So we're probably overfitting. Um, and, and yeah, we get pretty bad results um, um, looking at uh, on, on the test data here if we look at the mean squared error. So, um, so in this case, though, is, it was mostly because we had a, a bit of a so again, this is it's going to depend. If, if I rerun this, um, I might get better results. I normally don't get quite that bad a result uh, with this overfitting with no. Um, so yeah, I mean normally I get like this. So, so here it's probably going to be a lot better. Um, it, it 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 managed to converge for the 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 test train splits that we had here. So so this is probably more normal. We get something that looks about right, maybe a little bit overfitting. So it's probably overfitting. Uh, so this is this is more typical. So you'll see some things that look so. So we know that it's this this red is the true function, um, uh, a fifth degree polynomial. But we get some areas that look like we're misestimating um, on our function here. So, so yeah, you know, a, a, the the general thing, and, and this kind of carries over to deep learning systems or kind of more modern machine learning is. Uh, we instead want to use maybe an overpowered model, but then use some sort of um, um, search on metaparameters, like regularization parameters, to allow it to find the correct, uh, you know, to, to, the, the, the correct amount of regularization to, to, to get a good model out of the data without having to, to try and engineer the parameters by hand, like, like in this case, to try to engineer the, the, the actual exactly correct degree of the polynomial function that's underlying the data that we're trying to model here. So, so yeah, if you just use a little bit of regularization, even though you have like a de degree 10 polynomial, which a lot of people did have like a degree nine or 
or eight or something, um, you'll tend to get a pretty good result. That 0 0.32 or maybe even a little bit better. So. Um, Okay, um, one more real quick thing. So like I, I mentioned, um, um, I also had kind of posted, uh, this, was, this was a particular student submission that I thought was really well done. Um, you can take a look at that, I encourage you to. Uh, let, let me just mention one or two things about that because we didn't talk about, we haven't talked yet about, um, um, so I just called that assignment three, regression learning um, model submission there. Um, so the, the student um, had obviously maybe had a little bit of experience with scikit-learn before this. So, so if you look in there, you'll see that um, when they were doing their regularization, they were using um, 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 a grid search in here in order to try and find good values for the alpha parameters. So starting with the, the section four, uh, the part four and the part five, um, uh, you'll see that. So, so you might want to take a look at that. So instead of kind of doing these by hand, um, so, so this is becoming more of a common feature on machine learning frameworks like scikit-learn. So, so they have mechanisms in there to help you do meta parameter searches when you're getting down to this part of trying to build you know, trying to find, fit a good model to a set of data, right? So, you know, you, you, you know, if you're doing something serious, you don't want to kind of be randomly trying different things like I was sort of showing you uh, up to this point. Uh, you might want to do something more systematic. Um, and uh, scikit-learn has, has other things, but, but kind of the simplest is this grid search. So you can give it sort of a range. So in this case, like, like for example, when they were searching the a good value of alpha to use for the ridge regression. They give it, they, the, the student gave it a range from 10 to the minus four, so 0 0.0001 up to 10 to the minus one or 0.1. Um, and, and actually gave a thousand different values in that range, right? And did a grid search, right? And, and, it, and, and basically, and, and what the grid search does is it will fit and do, uh, in this case, a five fold cross validation. Um, for all of those, a thousand values of alpha, and it finds that the best that it comes up with, you know, again, this is doing it even better than what we kind of what I was doing, sort of ad hoc by hand, just trying to look at the the figure at, at the learning curves and determine this. Um, so this this is doing an actual cross validation and, and finds that the very best for the mean square, actually the negative mean squared error. So you have to take the negative of that um, and actually take the square root if you want to have the root mean squared error. But, but the best it gets is um, at an alpha 0 0.03 um, for the um, ridge regularization, right? So, so this is a very powerful kind of thing to do uh, if you really need to, um, you know, if, if you really need to, um, search a meta parameter space in a more uh, rigorous way than, than trying to just do things by hand, right? So, um, the student used the same thing uh, set up to, to search the polynomial degrees as well. So there was a good example of using the grid search with a defined function. Um, and this, um, if I'm reading this right, is basically do, doing more than what I asked for. This is looking at all uh, degrees of the polynomial from like a 1 to 100 um, or well, 1 to 99 or 0 to 99 or something like that. But yeah, if you, if you do that, um, you know, normally uh, it'll come up with a degree 7 or, or um, I think it usually does that because again, since we're doing, since uh, the student is doing cross-validation, um, it, it tends to be um, more consistent, right? So, so it, it almost always finds that degree seven. So again, remember that, that the true polynomial degree is five, so it finds something that's a little bit overpowered, uh, but that's good, and, and no regularization is being used here. So, so that makes kind of sense, that, that we get a slightly overpowered model, um, and that does kind of the best here. So. 
Um, so there's a question, uh, could you use a grid search to find the degree of polynomial? Oh, yeah, so, so yeah, maybe you asked that before I got to that. So yeah, you can, right? So sometimes, I mean, if, if it's a particular param meta parameter for uh, an object, um, um, again, you can look at this example um, in the, the part four and part five of this, uh, the student's notebook that I posted. Um, but you can just directly specify, um, so, so basically by setting a dictionary, uh, it knows that you're searching through the alpha parameter, um, meta parameter that's being passed into the ridge. So, those, so these different values of the alpha parameter, these alphas, all get tested out in the grid search, right? But if you're, uh, the, the polynomial degree isn't like a meta parameter that you can directly access um, here, but, but you can always set that up. And, and again, this, I thought this was well done. So uh, the, the student defines their own function. Um, um, so basically the grid search is gonna be calling this to create a pipeline. Um, and that pipeline is gonna be um, um, trying all these different polynomial feature degrees from like zero to 99 that's specified in the param grid. And that gets passed in as the, the first parameter here. So the, the, the pipeline creates the polynomial of the degree zero, one, two, three, so on up to 99 uh, to do the grid search here. Okay, um, uh, any uh, quick questions? I kind of want to take like a five minute break here. Um, and then we'll come back and maybe talk a little bit about logistic regression. All right, let me, let me go ahead and pause our recording for the moment. All right, um, I'm back. Um, why don't we go ahead and start again here, if you guys are all ready. Um, let's, yeah, so I don't know if I'll spend a whole lot. If you have questions about a whole lot of time on the um, logistic regression here, uh, let's, let's bring up the stuff here. Um, if you have questions on, on the, the stuff here, let me know. I uh, can't remember if there's anything. Let's see here. If I can rerun this. All right. Um, so yeah, let me just uh, kind of, kind of as a reminder or as context. Um, so, uh, so we've been spending three weeks, two weeks before this um, on chapter four stuff. So we went through linear regression um, and then we talked about um, class functions and grade descent um, and, and optimization, right? Um, and then we went on to kind of polynomial regression, regression which we used, which, which was a kind of main thing of this assignment three, and also regularization, which also got kind of emphasized in this assignment three, right? So, and, and, and then uh, here we're gonna be looking at kind of logistic regression this week. Um, um, if you haven't looked at these uh, notebooks yet, I encourage you to, you know, if, if you've got some time, you know, to, to not only use the, the lecture notebooks and the textbook, but um, 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 there's a lot of good stuff uh, out there as well. The, I think of it as kind of supplemental, but um, from the, the, the Dr. Ng's uh, class, and, and, and I kind of have my own Python notebooks from those things but uh but yeah once you get through the linear regression and regularization stuff um you know you might want to go back here um and, and look through these this other kind of course materials as well um to um um to uh you know to, to kind of re-emphasize re reinforce kind of the stuff that you should be going over here so so, the, and the other thing I started to say was, you know, this is really an important kind of section here, that this chapter four, 
Um, I mean, if I was writing this textbook, I probably would have broken this this chapter up. Uh, because a lot of, to me, a lot of this is the heart of, of this machine learning course here, right? So the things that you're learning about here for, you know, optimization methods and, and the cost functions and, and regularizations and metaparameter, the idea of, of metaparameters for these machine learning algorithms, um, these generalize to a lot of different supervised learning um, mechanisms. So, 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 you know, so, so hopefully you're paying a lot of attention for the, the, this kind of section of the class. A lot of our pedagogical goals for this course uh, are kind of tied to these, these things, these concepts that we're going over here. So, um, so with that said, the, the, then this week's materials might be um, less time consuming than some of the, the previous two weeks, because to me, logistic regression is, is the same mechanisms that you've learned about. We just have to modify the cost function a little bit uh, in order to make it suitable for classification problems instead of uh, regression problems, okay? So, you know, we've already talked about in this class um, the differences between doing um, uh, uh, supervised learning for a regression task. So that's where your output is a real valued number like you did for your assignment three here. You were trying to predict some value of, of like a, uh, a continuous function, right? Versus a classification where the output um, is a, um, um, is a, some discrete value. And the, the simplest case that we will mostly talk about uh, so in order to understand the general principles is we'll just restrict ourselves to thinking about a binary classification. So in that case, what we're trying to predict is a label of true or false or one or zero, right? So again, all this is review. We, we, we talked about classification already um, and, and kind of looked at it at least from using the scikit-learn and the, the stats model library to, to use even logistic regression before. So here, um, the difficulty, and, and um, our, our textbook doesn't um, give us good of, of a reason why the, um, the, the, the basic root mean squared error cost function doesn't work well for category, categorization problems, right? Um, so again, you know, if you want more about that, uh, I encourage you to look at the, the Dr. Ng's um, uh, videos on logistic regression. I think it gives a better kind of explanation for why um, uh, the, the, the standard root mean squared error just doesn't work as a good cost function if, if you want to do a classification, okay? Um, I mean, the, the, the basic, I mean, I, I guess maybe this is intuitive or somewhat intuitive is because uh, like a binary classification, we're going to change the label, labels of true, false, or, or yes, no, we're going to make those one or zero, right? Because it needs to be a number in order for us to run our machine learning algorithms for it, right? So for, for a regression label, the number can be any value. Right, but for like a, a classification, the label is going to be zero or one. So we really want um, the function, the, our prediction function, to give us a result that's only zero or one, or some value between zero and one. Okay. Um, so that's, I mean, you know, that that's not completely the whole story, but that's the reason why we use the sigmoid function because by, by taking, you know, so, so all we're doing for logistic regression, we're doing exactly the same um, linear combination of the features times the, the theta weights or theta coefficients. So, so this is exactly the same that we did for linear regression in here, but then we take that resulting value, whatever it is, and we put it through this sigmoid function, um, also known as kind of like a, a logistic function or the squashing function, right? And this is the shape of the sigmoid. Um, so, I mean, any value that, that's really, really big just becomes one, right? So once you're above 10 or above five effectively, um, the result after you go through the sigmoid is gonna be one, 
right? Same for negative five. You know, you're effectively anything negative six or so, it's effectively pretty much like zero uh, once you put it through this sigmoid function. Right? And, and that's the sigmoid function. Um, uh, this is kind of a, I, I don't know, again, you know, it's a little bit beyond the scope of this course. The, 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 there's, there's this, this function pops up in a lot of places in mathematics and there are deep reasons why, right? Um, I guess maybe the kind of the most important thing for the machine learning course to know is that this function is a continuous function. So, uh, and, and, you know, we can easily find the derivative of this. So we can easily um, write um, our gradient descent. So, so we can easily use this as a, a cost function for gradient descent. Um, uh, since, since the derivative is well defined um, and, and uh, for this function here. So, so that's kind of in a practical sense why one of the reasons why we use this. So, although others are used besides the sigmoid, but, but we'll just look at the sigmoid function here. Um, So yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the sigmoid actually gives you a value between zero and one. So, so you know, if, if your output of doing the linear um, combination of the features times the weight is only one, you actually get a value of, you know, point, whatever that is, point six or point six something, right? Somewhere right by here. So, so, so the, I mean, the, the sigmoid value, did, is, is not giving you your actual final label, zero or one. So basically the, the, the final um, value, so, so you can think of that as kind of like a probability that, it, that it's the, the true case, right? So, so if, if you have probability 0.6, you're saying that there's like a 60% chance, or you can think of it like that. There's a 60% chance that um, the category label is the positive label or the one label, right? So yeah, we, we, we call that p hat, uh, the, the result of taking that, uh, of the, the linear combination, the, the, the linear multiplication of the features times the theta parameters, taking that through the sigmoid function, we call that the, the probability or p hat. So I mean, so, so you have to, to have, you have to do some sort of a threshold. Um, and, and again, I mean, you could, we've talked a little bit about this. I mean, you could change the threshold, but, but for the most part, we just define that the threshold is going to be at zero. So anything that's at zero, I'm sorry, I mean, you know, we, we set a threshold of 0.5 for the p hat, but that effectively means that any value for the, the linear transformation before you put it for the sigma, any, any value that's less than zero is going to have a p hat of less than 0.5. So in that case, since, since the probability, since you think of the probability as being less than half, um, we're going to say that uh, if, if we're forced to choose the label zero or one, we're going to choose that it's, it's more likely to be the zero label or the negative label than the positive label, right? And, and if, if the, the value is greater than zero, which means that the p hat is going to be 0.5 or greater because right here, when, when, when um, when the result of this is zero, that's where it changes from being less than 0.5 to being greater than 0.5, right? That's the inflection point um, here. So anyway, yeah, so, so we use that threshold and if it's greater than 0.5, and it really doesn't matter whether you use greater than or greater than or equal, uh, again, because, you know, this is kind of a continuous function, so, you know, it can be kind of infinitely close to point. 0, 0.5, but just a little bit below it, you're going to guess zero and, and right on it or a little bit above it. So in, in, in a usual sense, you don't normally ever get a result that's exactly 0. 0.5. It's going to be somewhere either a little bit below or a little bit above, but anyway. Now, um, Because we've changed um, the, the, this is really the, the function that, that drives, that, that defines how we 
do our hypothesis. So given a set of theta values, um, what the current values of are the coefficients, this will tell us, you know, whether we, our hypothesis or our prediction is zero or one. Well, what the p hat is, and then the p hat, you put it through this to, to, to get the final prediction, y hat, zero or one, right? So now, though, we have to define um, a cost function if, um, Um, if we want to do an optimization to find the best values of theta, right? So the way that's done is again, you know, so, so there's differences because we're doing classification now, right? So the true value is going to be either zero or one. So what we want is we need a cost function that again, if we predict zero and it's zero, so here it's, it's, um, we have to use what's known as a piecewise function because there's two possibilities. So, so the true label, the true output could be either zero or one for a binary classification, right? So the case where we're trying to predict what, where the true label is one, right? So, so in that case, we want the cost to be really low if we predict one, right? So, so that's, that's what this, the, this represents the cost function. Right. So when the true label is one, we want the cost to be zero when we predict a one. Right. So when p hat predicts one, we get a cost of one. Right. And, and, and likewise, we want the cost function to be really high. So have a high cost when we're making a bad prediction. So, so again, when the true label is one, but we're predicting zero or 0 0.1, the, the cost ends up getting worse and worse, the, 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 the more that you think the probability is zero when it in fact is a positive case, a positive label, right? So that, that's, that's the shape of this cost function, but only piecewise for, the, for when y is equal to one here, for, for, the, for when the true label is one case. Um, so, and you can do the same thing for for the, the, the case when the label is zero, when y is equal to zero, um, uh, all you have to do is take the, you know, the, the, the complement of, of that, right? So, so the function is really just the mirror of what we had before. But, but, you know, again, this works as a cost function. So for a cost function to work, you need to be giving a cost of zero because we're trying to minimize the cost. You want to have a cost of zero when your predictions are doing well, right? So if we're predicting, probability of zero when the true label is a zero, then we want a real low cost associated with that. And if we're predicting a one when, when the true label is zero, that should become a high cost. And that's what this function does. Okay? So why the log? Um, again, there's reasons for this, which we won't go into in this class, uh, but um, this function is, um, I guess I, I kind of said the same thing, but I really meant it for this function here. So, so the, the, the log, um, you know, we, we can calculate the derivative. This is a smooth function, and, and we can have an expression that tells us the derivative or the gradients of this. Um, so we can still use this. Oh, and, and this also is actually a convex function. So like for the linear regression, this works well um, for optimization techniques because there's only going to be one a global minimum that, that's defined using this as a cost function. So, so we can use optimizations like gradient descent with this as a cost function to find the best values of theta that, that will minimize the cost for a set of data that we're trying to model or fit. Okay. So um, at this point in my lecture notebook, um, you know, try not to get too hung up on, on kind of the mathematical no notation if some of that goes by you. Um, and again, you know, you might want to look at the, if, if you are interested and, and tr want to try to get deeper into those, um, I encourage you to look at the Dr. Ng's videos because uh, he probably does a better job of explaining it than me or, or our textbook that we're using, at least the, the mathematical um, Expressions of these, um, so I'll just kind of try and quickly go over these, you know, so putting that together, we can define an overall cost function. So J, we're using J to mean the cost for some particular um, assignments for the theta parameters. 
So once we've decided on what theta parameters are, we can, we can calculate the cost using um, this piecewise cost function. We do a little bit of a trick here. So by multiplying yi, so again, y is, is, is either zero or one. So for the one case, if we multiply it by that, um, so, so when y is one, if we just multiply it by that, um, this term will stay in, right? But when y is one, if you take one minus that, that becomes zero and that term drops out and vice versa. So when, when the, the true label is zero for the ith instance, then this is just going to be zero times that. So that term will drop out and then one minus that becomes one and you get the other, the, the, the mirrored cost function for when the true label is, is zero. All right? So that, that's, that's kind of a little bit of a mathematical trick to turn this piecewise function into a single mathematical expression. Um, and like I said, again, it's beyond the scope of this, but it turns out that it's not too tough to calculate the derivative of this, you know, even though we've got a uh, summation uh, in here. And then the, the expression for the derivative, which we can use to do gradient descent or do optimization, is this, okay? And if you look at this, um, I wish I would have brought up um, If you look back at, to, at our notebook for um, uh, not assignment three, but um, maybe I don't have it open up yet. So back to the very first one for linear regression. In there, there should have been an expression for um, the derivative of the cost function if you look down in there. Where is it? Um, here's the, the, the cost function, or maybe it was in the notebook with gradient descent. Um, probably was. Because yeah, we didn't talk about um, we didn't talk about that. There it is. That's what I was trying to look for. Um, so if you look at these side by side, um, besides the difference between one and two m, um, and that's right. Um, but notice. Um, the, the, the expression when we, for the, the gradient for the cost function for linear regression is this one over here on the right, and the gradient for the expression for the cost function for logistic regression is over here. Right? And notice they're basically the same. The only difference is that we're taking the sigmoid of this over here. We don't take the sigmoid, right? So that's, that's another reason why this particular function was chosen because when you take the derivative of it, you get an expression that is basically the same as what we have for um, our gradients, you know, for our derivatives for linear regression. The, you know, so if, if you wanted to implement by hand, I, I don't think I, you know, we, we, I showed an implementation of, of doing gradient descent by hand for linear regression. I don't think we did that although we might have done that in the Dr. Ng's videos at some point, right? But basically, you could take a, a function that implements gradient descent, um, or a function that implements the, 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 the gradient for the cost function, and they would be almost exactly identif identical for linear regression versus logistic regression. All you have to do is, after you take the combination of the theta times the, the, the feature x, you just, apply the sigmoid function if we're doing a logistic regression, right? So anyway, I mean, you know, that's a little bit of an, uh, of an interesting detail, but what it means is that um, in effect, um, you know, using an optimization, gradient descent, or, or a more complex um, version of, of a gradient descent optimizer, we can pretty much use exactly the same kind of cost function 
between a logistic versus a linear regression um, to do this here. Um, okay, so so yeah, the the um, kind of the next um, section um, on the video for this week was about decision boundaries, right? So this is kind of an important concept. So this is similar to again for gradient descent. Most likely, what we do for gradient descent is once you um, optimize for the theta parameters, then you would, sh you would plot the line that represents the model that you just fit, okay? So in two dimensions, you get a line. If it's a linear model that you're fitting, if it's, if it's three dimensions, you would get a plane. Or if it's higher, you would get a hyperplane, right? Um, or as you saw for assignment three, if you're fitting uh, um, um, a nonlinear function, you would get, uh, if it's just two dimensions, you would get the, the curve, which represents the predicted uh, regression value, right? So, so anyway, th there's a similar concept, but when for a um, classification problem, once you optimize your theta parameters, what you're gonna get is, is um, a set of theta parameters that um, if I can go back up to um, um, here, is that uh, somewhere uh, those theta parameters, um, however many dimensions you have in, in the space that you're fitting your model to, uh, so for all for that particular point in that space, the, the, the parameters, if, if we're doing a binary classification, will either come up and say that I should predict zero or predict one, okay? So that, that place, you know, that, 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 that location of that boundary for um, all of your different features uh, in your parameter space is what's known as the decision parameter, okay? And, and, and that's similar to, you know, the, the line, the fitted line or the fitted curve um, that you get when you're doing a regression problem but um, that uh, that line for the decision boundary marks the the the, the boundary in your spaces uh, where you go from predicting one class or the other if it's a binary classification. Okay, and you can visualize these. Um, probably the easiest way to visualize these is to use. Um, I mean, if you just have a single feature the decision boundary is just gonna come down to a point, um, basically. So at, at some particular value in your feature space, so if I have a single feature pedal width, at, at, uh, and, and if I do an optimization using logistic regression, like we, which we did here, it's, it's gonna tell you that um, any value below, whatever this is, 1.6 something, or 1.6606, um, we should predict that it's the um, the, the not virginica, right? And, and any value above that, so that becomes the decision boundary. Any value above that point is is uh, we should predict it's the virginica value. Okay, but you know, so if, if you have more than one feature, then then instead of a point, you're going to end up having either a line or some sort of a a line that could be state uh, straight or curvy, depending on if you did a linear. Um, model or you fit it in a nonlinear model um, or, or you know it'll, it'll be a plane or some sort of a um, um, what's the correct technical term um, it'll, it'll be some sort of a shape basically that, that separates uh, three or more dimensions so like a hyperplane if, if you're again if you're doing some sort of a linear model or a more complex decision boundary if, if you're doing like a nonlinear Okay. So the most general thing is, basically, is to go back and use the contour plots. Like um, um, we've seen some examples of these before. Um, so, for example, um, here in our lecture notebook for this week, we were uh, we were fitting. Um, uh, where is it? Um, So 
So in this first example, we just had a single feature. Um, but then in the second example, we use two features. So, so our feature space has two dimensions, right? Uh, oh yeah, and, and then we just fit, yeah. So, so we're fitting um, a, a logistic regression. So again, the default is to fit a linear model here. So a linear decision boundary. Um, you can fit a nonlinear function, what we'll talk about later in this class. So a nonlinear decision boundary. Right. So, but anyway, if you do that, and if you use contour plot, you'll be able to use that to discern the location in two dimensions, which will end up being a line in two dimensions. So anything above and to the right, um, after we fit um, using these two parameters, which were pedal length and pedal width, we will end up predicting it should be Virginica. Anything to the left and, and lower would be not very big, right? So that's that's what we mean kind of by the decision, decision boundary. So all points over here would get a prediction of not Virginica, and all points over here would get a prediction of Virginica, right? And that's the, the, that's the, the dividing line between those two, right? And um, yeah, and again, I just pulled this from our textbook, you know, so here, if, you're in, if, if you want to know what these are, so we plotted some other contour lines. So these represent that probability score. And all of these are going to be lines as well, but this is where the probability goes from being less than 0.15 to greater than 0.15, the, the p hat, right? And this is 0.45 and so on, right? And all of these are lines because we fit, we just use a linear regression, uh, sorry, a logistic regression without changing any of the parameters, so, so the default is to get a linear decision boundary um, in this case, right? Which, you know, you can see, you know, that, um, I mean, it's gonna be a little bit problematic. I mean, it's not bad. There's one or two points that, um, that are Virginicas that end up on the wrong side of the decision boundary and vice versa. There's one or two not Virginicas that end up on the wrong side of the decision boundary. So what I mean by nonlinear, I mean, you can make a lot of nonlinear regression, so you could end up with a decision boundary that kind of curves around here, comes up here, right? So, um, and we'll see some more examples of that, um, like when we use uh, kernels for support vector machines coming up in two weeks or so. Um, Okay, and, and um, yeah, let's see here. So just kind of wrap up here. Let me know if, if, if there's any questions at this point here. Um, but, but yeah, we're almost kind of done here. Um, so, I mean, we could, we, we already, again, we've already talked about this in this class. We could extend everything that we've done here. Uh, if we need to do a classification problem with this not binary but a multi-class classification we could just like like we did here where we we had reduced it down to virginica versus not virginica we could also um, build a, a separate logistic linear logistic um, classifier for um, um, uh, drawing a blank on the names of, of um, for iris versus non or sorry, for, for versicolor versus non versicolor. And we could we could create a third one for setosa versus non setosa. And then we could combine those by taking the one with the highest p hat um, and then declaring that as the winner if we did a um, one versus all. Okay. Or, you know, again, we talked about we, we could also do the one versus one, have iris versus, or have virginica versus versicolor, virginica versus setosa, and versicolor versus setosa, which for three classes it gives you about the same result, but, uh, but yeah. Um, so the softmax, um, though, um, is a alternative. Um, version of the um, the um, cost function, which allows you to directly, I don't know if it's fair, I, I mean, you still end up kind of behind the scenes uh, training multiple classifiers, one for each class, okay? So, uh, 
so so it's maybe a little bit unfair to say that it directly supports like a multi-class using using this soft max um, cost function. So, um, I didn't want to, to, to spend a whole lot of time on this because, uh, I mean, not that, I mean, softmax uh, will pop up in some other places, I think, that we're using this class. Actually, uh, in deep learning, uh, it pops up uh, is, is, is more important, the, 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 the softmax uh, cost function. Um, so, I mean, this is kind of the expression for it. What it, it's kind of doing um, is, um, Again, it's, it's kind of normalizing this, so you get basically a probability that it's each uh, uh, class or not based on the the sum of the probabilities over all of these separate um, classifiers that that are kind of defined um, in this thing here. So, um, and yeah, you know, I, it's it's probably not. I mean, it, it's interesting, but it's probably not. Um, crucial that you understand all of this um, if, if you don't want to get into the details of this, at least not right now. Um, although it is nice to know that, um, you know, again, for like, um, uh, to, to know what this is and, and to know that for, for scikit-learn, for example, um, if you want to use a softmax classifier, a softmax cost function, uh, to do a multinomial classifier, if you, if you specify the, the parameter multinomial for multi-class, what it's really doing is it's, it's using this, this alternative version of the cost function, right? Um, so so the, anyway, that would give you a, a, um, the softmax, and, and, and the, the, the practical effect is that I can train it on um, all of my targets, right? So in this case, the... Um, Iris dataset has three possible classes, um, so, so we can train those all at once, doing the fit here, and um, um, and we can also display the um, decision boundaries for um, that we end up getting. Right, so you'll notice again by default that the the decision boundaries is actually linear. Right, so we've got the decision boundary between the um, the Satosa is kind of this yellow, and the purple over here, or the blue, is the, the Versicolor, right? And this is the boundary between the Sedosa and the Virginica, and this is the, the, the decision boundary between the Virginica and the Versicolor here. But, but all the, these boundaries end up being linear decision boundaries in this case. So. Um, yeah, so like I said, I mean, you know, we might come back to softmax. Um, I, I don't want to kind of try and get into the details of this. So, so don't worry too much if you don't quite get all the details of this. Just kind of, it's probably most important that you understand that it's an alternative that allows you to a little bit more directly do a multinomial uh, classify, classification. So a multi-class classification with logistic regression here. Um, Um, okay, yeah, so I, I think I'm kind of getting ready to wrap up here. Um, are there kind of questions? Anybody want to ask anything about anything here? Okay, um, I think, I mean, I certainly am kind of uh, pretty tired and ready to stop here. So um, I think I'm going to go ahead and end the session. Um, so as usual, if you, have, if you have questions, feel free to send, me, send them to me by email um, or however. Um, otherwise, yeah, I'll, I will kind of stop the session for today here. Let's see if I can stop the recording. <clears throat>